If you and I know the way, why aren't we guiding people the way, the truth, and the way that they can have life and have it in abundance? Are we attracted to Jesus because of what and who He is? Accomplished to draw man back into ourselves, to draw them out of the hands of the enemy, to bring them back to your glory. Is there any other way? Death, didn't everybody hear me now? Amen. So awesome to be here this morning with each and every one of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here with us this morning. What an awesome time we had. Um, in Juarez with, our, with the conference, man, it was powerful this year. It was just, just amazing. Got to meet some amazing people. And um, you know, just, just one of the things is, man, they, everywhere we went, they wanted to feed us. <laughs> so I'm like, híjole, man, you know, but but praise God that everything went well, and, and we were truly blessed by everyone, and man, they treat you like family, you know, like if you're one of their own, and, and we're so appreciative for that. Amen. So I just want you guys to keep uh, my wife in prayer. She, she's not feeling too good, um, so let's pray for her. I say, what's wrong, my love? She says, it's because I ate like a piggy out there. And, you know, she's had issues in the past with her kidneys and stuff, and it just triggers it at times, different kinds of food and stuff. But she's there fasting and drinking her teas, you know. And uh, so let's just keep her in prayer. And anyone else that, that's missing, let's keep um, Arnold and, and Sister Brooklyn in prayer as they travel to Colorado to go find Mimo. I mean to go find a, a place for their event, for their wedding uh, party in June. Amen? Amen. So today's going to be the final part of Spirit-Filled Warfare, Part 9. How many of you have been blessed by it? I sure have been so blessed by it that it was um, just a powerful thing to know that God is for us and not against us. Amen. Knowing that he has prepared us for that war. Knowing that he has prepared us for that warfare. You know, but it's up to us, okay, to be able to use what he has, he has utilized for us to prepare. Use it for his glory. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And we're going to read all the way to 24. And today is going to be specifically on prayer. Okay, I believe prayer is what ties in all the armor. Okay, so we can't lose sight of the prayer. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Um, get my glasses. Amen. Thank you. I was wondering what was wrong with the light. I'm like, it's usually a little brighter than that. Amen. So we're going to start in verse 10. And the word of the Lord says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand 
Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication. That's going to be our focus in 18 and moving forward. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful in this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And 21, it goes on and says, it says, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have spent, sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Amen. So uh, as we have moved through the final verses of the book of Ephesians, okay, which is going to be our focus this morning, we have been dealing with the issue of spiritual warfare. How many of you know that spiritual warfare exists? How many of you know that there's a war out there Waging war on our soul. Hmm. Most believers really don't believe that we are engaged in a battle with an unseen yet very powerful enemy. It doesn't change the fact that we are. See, we have to understand that there's an enemy out there that's ready to take us out. He's ready to destroy us. He's ready to steal our, our testimony. He's ready to steal our testimony. He's ready to devour us back into his kingdom because at one time, see what, thank you, bro. At one time, he, we belong to him. See, we have to understand that if we're not serving God wholeheartedly, which that's what he desires, then who are we serving? We're serving Satan. If you're serving yourself, you're serving Satan. Okay? We have to understand that there's a war. But we have to also understand that that war has already been won by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, and sometimes we walk around feeling so defeated feeling like, man, we can't take another step when God has ordained your steps. But see, I think sometimes we don't believe in the power that he has already given us to be able to overcome the battles that we face each and every day of, the, of life. Even though we're engaged in this war, we have to understand that we need to take the stand and stand up and say enough is enough. See, Satan, the enemy of God, is also the enemy of God's people. He hates us. He can't stand us. He hates when we come to church. He hates when we fellowship. He hates when we open up our Bibles. He hates, hates, and hates when we open our eyes each and every morning. So what's going to happen? He's going to do whatever he can to devour you, to make you believe that you're not worthy, to make you believe that what for do you open up the Bible because you don't understand nothing. He, he comes in with these tricks, and, and the funny thing is, is that we believe him. We believe him, so we tend to move away from those things that are going to help us. We, we move away from fellowship. We move away from doing the things of God because we're like, man, what's going on? 
See, we end up buying into the lies of the devil. His desire for us is to defeat us, destroy us, and devour us. The word of the Lord says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5.8 Using what the Bible calls wiles in Ephesians 6.11, which speaks of deceit and diabolical schemes, he seeks to trick us. He wants to trick us into believing that we're doing the right thing. How many of you have been there? See, James 1.14 reminds us, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, the words drawn away are taken from the world of hunting and fishing, where the hunter and the fisherman use various means to lure their prey from a place of safety. The word entice means to catch by a bait. See, Satan is like a master hunter or a master fisherman. He sets his traps and baits hooks. He lies in wait to capture and destroy the unexpecting believer. He's not going to come to your doorstep and say, Hey, I'm Satan. Or I'm one of his workers, I came to destroy you. No, he's not going to show up in that manner. But sometimes that's what we think he's going to show up as. He's going to come in through any little crack or any little window, any little, the least amounts. You're like, man, all my windows are sealed. But remember that little crack that you refuse to fix. That's where he's going to enter in through. And he's going to disguise himself as an angel of light. He's going to pull you away from your faith. He's going to pull you away from God. He's going to pull you away from fellowship. He's going to pull you away from Bible study. He's going to pull you away from attending church because he knows that these things motivate you and encourage you to continue to serve and seek the faith of God on a daily basis. And that happens a lot in relationships. We're like, God had to have put him in my life for a reason. We're not going to get in a relationship to save the person. He's not going to mix up a believer with an unbeliever. But we have to understand that. It happens so much. I see it in relationships over and over and over and over again. See, the word drawn away are taken from the world of hunting and fishing. If we are not sober and vigilant, as the Bible tells us to be, we will be assaulted or worse. How do we keep our eyes open? How do we understand who we're up against? We need to know our enemy. See, when, when um, the military go into battle, they don't go into battle blinded. They have to know their enemy. They need to know their schemes. They need to know what kind of traps they use. They need to know where, where they could be hiding. See, they need to know their enemy. If not, guess what? They're going to get attacked and they're going to get blindsided. See, you need to study your enemy. And I'm not saying serve your enemy. No. What I'm saying is that you have to understand his tricks so that you can learn how to fight him and battle him. See, we do not have to become victims of Satan's traps and devices. God has equipped us with everything we need to stand against the devil and attacks. He's equipped us. He's prepared us. See, if we use the means God has given us, we will not become casualties in the spiritual war in which we are engaged. That is the promise of God in Ephesians 6.13. We have considered the pieces of the armor that are listed. We've talked about the pieces we've, we've talked about, how to utilize them. We talked about putting them on. We talked about not taking them off.
But today we're going to talk about the final. And it's, it's what puts the whole armor together is prayer. How is our prayer life? Prayer is perhaps one of the greatest provisions we have been given by the Lord. The provision of prayer. So let's look at the truth laid out in Ephesians 18 and uh, 6, 18 and through 20. These verses have a lot to say to us about the matter of prayer and about how prayer should be utilized in our, spirit, in our spiritual conflicts. How many of us have conflicts in, in a daily basis? How many of us have challenges? I wish I could tell you and say, hey, you know what? It's going to get better. It's going to... You have to understand, church, that the enemy wants us back into his kingdom. But just because you have challenges doesn't mean that you have to be moping around all day either. Just because you have things that are coming up in your life doesn't mean that you have to be walking with your tail behind your legs. But what it does mean is that we have to learn how to defeat these obstacles through prayer and believing God that God is already taking care of it before we even bring it to Him. See, Paul does not put forth prayer as a weapon, but as the means of utilizing the armor he has already talked about. Prayer is how we put on the whole armor of God. So we're going to look at the concept of spirit-filled prayer, the context of spirit-filled prayer, and the content of spirit-filled prayer. So let's talk first about the concept of prayer. And the context of this passage is about prayer. Specifically, it is about how we are to utilize prayer in our daily lives and in the context of spiritual warfare. The dictionary defines prayer as a request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God. The word used here speaks of general requests made to God. So we take the definition, and I think they are pretty good. Prayer is simply talking to God, having a conversation with Him. But when we have a conversation, it's not a conversation if we're the only ones talking. How many of us have ever had a conversation and, and you don't say nothing? I mean, other than with your spouse. Right? Like we're talking to ourselves. But a conversation is when two people are interacting. We have to, in order to hear the other person, we need to be quiet. That's the same thing it is with God. He's not going to speak over people or anything like this. We have to remain silent so that we can hear Him, so that we can listen to Him, so that He can direct us and guide us in all truth. And that's something that, in my walk, that I had to learn because I wasn't a very good listener. I always had my opinions about everything. I always had my know-how about everything. But I never listened. See, if we don't listen, we're never going to take on good correction. See, when correction happens, especially from God, it's because He's trying to take us away from our own way of thinking and, and direct us back into His path. See, the idea of prayer being the breath of the soul. In Martin Luther's mind, when he said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Anytime we turn our attention toward God and speak to Him, we are praying. Our praying can take many forms. We pray in private. At other times, we pray in public. We pray in loud voices. Other times, we whisper our prayers and sometimes pray in silence. We set aside times for prayer, and at other times, we pray in spontaneous occurrences. 
We pray in all types of positions and postures. We sit, we stand, we kneel, we lie down. We pray when we walk, we, we, when we drive, and when we rest. We pray at home, at church, at work, or on vacation. We pray with our hands up and heads down, or with our heads down and our hands up. We pray with our eyes open or closed. See, the Bible talks about many forms of prayer, places of prayer, postures of prayer, and circumstances of prayer. Yet the Bible does not exalt any form, place, posture, or circumstance for prayer above another. Jesus prayed while he was here. He prayed standing, sitting, kneeling, and possibly in other positions as well. We can pray anywhere at any time about anything at any posture. That is what prayer is. See, this passage also tells us when we should pray. Paul says, praying always. Can everybody say praying always? Praying always. Can everybody say it again? Praying always. always. The word always carries the idea of at all times. Everybody say at all times. At all times. In all seasons, everybody say in all seasons. At, all seasons. at every opportunity, and everybody said. Every opportunity. Amen. I like to get you all engaged a little bit, you know. See, the Jews in Paul's day had several set times per day when they prayed. The Muslims in our day have five specific times for prayer every day. Every day, Christianity also has a specific set time for prayer. Our time for prayer is all the time. All the time. Hallelujah. Amen. Scott gets a gold star. <laughs> See, the Bible speaks of this in several places. In Romans 12, 12 the word of the Lord says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, Continuing instant in prayer. Colossians 4.2 The word says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. There is no time when we do not need to pray. There is no time when we cannot pray. There is no time when God will not be listening and when He will not hear us. To pray always does not mean that we are walk around in an attitude of formal prayer. Neither Jesus, not even His disciples did that. To pray always does not mean that we follow ritualistic prayers that are recited manual, manually from books. To pray always does not mean that we count beads or repeat, memorize prayers, pray, prayer phrases. That is what the pagans did in Matthew 6, 7. To pray always does not mean that we live in constant awareness of God and His presence. To pray always does not mean that the soul is ever reaching up toward God. To pray always does not mean that we see everything and everything experienced as a kind of prayer to God. When we are tempted, we call on Him, asking Him for help. When we, when we see sin and wickedness, we call on Him to work in the situation to make it right and to work it out for His glory. When we see something beautiful, we give thanks to God. When we enter a time of trouble, we look to God for help and deliverance. When we weep, we lean on God for support. When we are happy, we lift our hearts to God in thanksgiving. When we, are, when we meet a lost sinner, we ask the Lord to convict them and save them. We also ask for His help to witness to them. When life is lived in that way, it becomes an ever-ascending prayer to the Lord. 
There will be times when we get along with God to pray most of the time. However, our lives should be a continual exhalation, exhalation of the soul breathing out its love for and the dependence upon God. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own selves that we forget to seek the Lord. We get caught up in our own troubles that we forget to seek the Lord. How many of us are guilty? See how tricky the enemy is? And I'm not here by no means to give him any credit at all because he deserves no credit, but I want you to understand that he's not dumb either. He was, he was God's most highest angel of worship. But he, he, his pride, he wanted to be God. He wasn't happy with his position. So they demoted him to the, lat, to the bottom of the totem pole. See, when we seek the face of God and we're asking him, for certain things or, be, or specific things. Sometimes we pray for the unknown. We don't understand everything. We don't know everything. But that's not for us to either question it or anything, but we need to pray. We need to seek the face of God. We need to understand where is it that he wants us, what is it that he wants us to do. But at the same token, we want to listen to God. We want to be able to understand and hear his voice. You know, this last... Um, when we were in Juarez, we went to this mercado, and my wife went one way, and me and Jose went another way. We we're looking for some stuff. And I'm not kidding, she was probably about eight or nine aisles like, away from me. She called out my name. She was looking for me. I heard her say, my love. Immediately, I understood. I knew it was her. I knew it was her. Why? Because of the relationship that I have with my wife. See, in order to, to understand and hear the voice of God when he is speaking to you, we have to have that relationship with him. It's not going to work any other way. Sometimes we're like so confused. We don't know what to think. We don't know what to do. We don't know what direction. That is because you stop and think you're the only one that's been talking. We ask God for this, we ask God for that, but we don't shut up and listen. We have to, I should say, we don't be quiet and listen. Sorry about that. I'm rephrasing my English. See, that is the idea behind the phrase, watching thereunto with all perseverance. With all perseverance, this means that we are to be on the alert with our eyes open to the needs around us. We are to be steadfast, constant, and persistent as our souls reach upward to God for the help we and others need. See, God honors the always prayers. God honors the watchful, persevering prayers of all his people. In two parables, Jesus addressed this matter. In one parable, a persistent man continued asking for bread from his neighbor. In the middle of the, ma the, of the night, he asked until his request was granted. At the end of the parable, Jesus said this in Luke eleven nine. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. In the second parable, Jesus spoke about a widow who petitioned a judge about her need. She continued to aggravate the judge until he gave, it. he gave in and granted her request. At the end of the parable, Jesus said this in Luke 18, 7 and 8, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. 
Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. See, the point of both of those parables is that God answers the specific, persistent prayers of his people. It always too soon to stop praying. Ever let your soul release its breath toward the Father in heaven. Sometimes we're praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. And, we, and then this is a specific prayer. We can be praying for someone. We can be praying for a situation. And we've not seen any results. How many of us have been there? We don't see any result. We're like, man, well. So sometimes we give up on that prayer. We're like, you know what? We just can't stop. Imagine if my wife would have stopped. And I'm sure her flesh wanted her to stop many times. Our flesh wants us to stop many times. You look at the Israelites. They went on this journey. It took them so long when it was right, the right, right around the corner. An 11-day trip it took them 40 years. That's a long time. And that sometimes our prayer is just about to get answered. And just before it gets answered, we quit and we stop. See, we have to understand, church, that the Word of God will never return back void. The Word of God is always going to accomplish what it set out to accomplish. If you're speaking salvation over your family, then continue to speak it and know that it's going to come to pass. But we give this excuse, oh, well, my family is just so hard-headed and they so... They're never going to get it. But you got to remember, church, that we were once those hard-headed people. And the Spirit of God came in and broke down those barriers. Why? Because of our consistent and our persistent in prayer. And there was many times that we wanted to give up. We're like, he's probably one of the ones that are going to end up going to hell. And we give up. Don't give up. Continue to pray. If you're having issues in your, in your marriage, in your family, whatever, continue to pray. Pray a prayer that's going to be pleasing unto the Lord. Because it works. Prayer works. I'm a proven spokesperson for it. See, I'm here because of my wife's persistent prayer. But I'm also here because of all those men throughout the, my life, the, the, those ministering angels that God sent into my life that planted that seed. Now I was able to get receive all the watering that my wife did for it to come to pass. Don't give up. Don't give up. We have to understand, church, that your family is depending on you, and they don't even know it. They're depending on your prayers so that they can come to the throne of God and give their heart and life to Him. But we have to be persistent, church. We've got to believe that it's possible, church. We can't stop, church. We have to continue, 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 continue to be steadfast in our prayers. And during that time, the enemy is going to come, and he's going to do whatever he can to, keep, to stop you. He's going to throw whatever roadblocks he can to keep those prayers from coming, to discourage you, to make you believe otherwise. But let me tell you, church, as long as we stay connected with the Lord, as long as we stay in his word, we're not going to listen to those things. Why? Because he's going to continue to protect us, protect our mind, protect our heart, protect our mouth. This morning, as Maria's mom was entering the church, I'm like, wow. The doctors were basically saying, hey, you know what? Just send her home. There's nothing else we can do and just let her die. I mean, if, it doesn't matter how old a person is. Everybody deserves life until God says it's done. Only God can, can continue to produce life or he can take you home, either one. And I see her mom, and I'm like, man, she just blesses me so much. I remember I talked to, Patri uh, to 
Maria a couple of days before or a day before. And she's like, Pastor, you know, they, they told my, they said that there's nothing they can do, that they're just going to send her home. And, and I'm thinking in my mind, man, she's probably an intubator. She's probably like, I mean, you know, they wanted her to go to hospice and all these things. And I get to the hospital and I go see her mom. And I'm like, she looked the same way. I'm like, what are these people even talking about? Why do they start believing these people? And we prayed, and I asked her, do you remember when I went in the room? She says, yes, I do. You know, and then she ended up just ignoring me and fell asleep, but that's okay. <laughs> Some people do that when they speak to me, you know, they just like doze off. But I seen her walking in this morning, and I'm like, wow. How old's your mom? 94 years old, huh? 94 years old. Praise the Lord, right? Wow, still walking on her own. Praise God. I mean, that, that's an encouragement to me. Say, man, I can live to 100 years old. You know? See, but we have to believe. We have to believe that the prayers that we have, see, when our, our, our relationship with the Lord is strengthened, okay, when we have that strength with the Lord, when... when we're in the word and we get that, that strength that only comes from the Lord and we believe in his word. Then when we pray for people, we're going to know that those prayers are going to come to pass. You know, I've ta talked about this before, but me and my wife went to visit this lady one time. They had already told the family to put her in hospice. And they did put her in hospice. She didn't die after two weeks, so, I mean, there's only a limit in house hospice, so you have to go to home hospice. And me and my wife would visit them. And, and for those of you that know my wife, man, she went into this, we went into this home that was covered, the windows were, she started opening up windows, opening up light. I mean, it was just amazing. And we just started speaking. And a couple of months later, they get a doctor visit, and the doctor tells her, you're not supposed to be in hospice, you're supposed to be in rehab. So she went from being in hospice to being in rehab. And she still lived like eight, nine years after that. She was an elderly lady. But I mean, only God knows when your time is up. Only God knows. He came to give us life and life in abundance. And when our number's called, it's our number's called. That's it. So now let's look at something else, the content of prayer. This context, this text tells us some of the things that should fill our prayers. Paul divides our prayer lives into two parts. He mentions prayers. This refers to prayer that is general in scope. Paul calls this kind of praying all prayer. That literally means all kinds of prayer. It is a kind of praying we do that, that is sometimes nonspecific. For instance, there are times when we will pray for faithful preachers and missionaries. We will pray for the church. We pray for persecuted brethren around the world. We pray for our fellow churches. We pray for many other things in the same way. We don't necessarily call out all the names, places, and needs involved, but we pray for those people and situations in a general way. I believe God hears those prayers, and I believe He answers them. Why? Because our focus is taken away from us, and our focus is put on somebody else. He knows our hearts, he knows the specific needs far better than we do. I don't really know what you need. But God does. I sometimes don't even know what the church needs. I don't know what the church down the road needs. I don't know what the pastor needs. I don't know what he's going through. But we're so easily 
to start pointing fingers and name calling and doing all these things, which we need to be praying for the church. We need to be praying for the body of Christ. I don't know if there's pastors that, that are afraid of speaking boldly because they're afraid of losing their people, then we need to pray for those pastors that God would give them a vision, Amen. that God would increase their faith, Amen. knowing that it's all about Him and not about us. Because literally, God has called us to win souls for the kingdom of God. He has called us to expand His kingdom here on earth. So many of us, we go to church because, man, they have an awesome worship team. We go to church because, man, I just love the jokes the pastor says. We go to church for all the wrong reasons. How many of us can say, man, I go to church because, man, the truth, the truth of the living God is still transforming me inside and out and convicting me of sin. Because how many of you know that we need to talk about sin? Because sin is what can keep us from heaven. So we need to expose sin. By exposing sin, we're able to be delivered from that sin by an all-gracious and holy Father. He mentioned supplication. This word refers to prayers that are very specific in nature. In these verses, Paul, some specific areas that should occupy praying. All saints, in Ephesians 6.18, remember supplication refers to specific requests. If you have a sickness, I can pray specifically about that. If you lost people in your family, I can pray specifically for that. If you have a financial need, I can pray specifically about that. If you have a burden, I can pray specifically for that. When the need is known, the prayer should be specific. When we pray specifically, we and God answers our prayer, it gives us confidence in our prayer lives and assurance in the power of God to both hear and answer our prayers because we can see that prayer being answered. So it encourages us saying, man, God is so powerful. God is healing. God is restoring. God is redeeming to this day. This morning I was talking to, to, uh, to Sister Annette. And she was telling me about an issue that she had with her feet. That she just, she's constantly on her feet. And they just so painful and hurting and. And stuff, and she says, Pastor, she says, I'm, I believe and I know that the Lord has healed me because I haven't felt pain or anything. I'm able to handle the job. I'm able to be on my feet with no pain. And that, why does God do that knowingly? Because now she can glorify God through that specific prayer because that prayer was specific. It wasn't for the unknown, but it was specific. Making your request be known to God specifically and that's what she did. And now she's here. She's going to take Scott dancing. <laughs> They're going to go to Dancing of the Stars. <laughs> See, there's a reason and a purpose you're here today. The enemy will always use tools to try to keep you from doing what's right, to making right decisions. Because we're all faced on a daily basis to make a decision, whether right or wrong. To glorify God or to bring shame to His name. What's it going to be? In Ephesians 19 and 20, now Paul makes some specific request for himself, he reminds his friends in Ephesus that he is in bonds. He assures them that his imprisonment is for the glory of God by calling himself an ambassador. His request for prayer is that he might be given utterance 
that he might open his mouth and speak boldly and that he might make known the mystery of the gospel. He asked for prayer that he might preach as he ought to speak. When we're in difficult situations, it's very hard for us to say, Lord, use this situation to bring glory to you, Lord. Use this situation so that I can be, speak boldly to these people. Use this situation for this. But we're so selfish. We're like, Lord, please get me out of this situation. It's like, how can I get in this situation? I need to be out of this situation. Please save me from this situation. Instead of using the situation for an opportunity to bring glory to the Father. Knowing that everything that we do ought to be for the glory of God. Everything that takes place in our lives should be for the glory of God. It's not look at me, check me out. It's look at the power of God because I'm here. Because God has truly, truly moved in my life. He's truly moved in your life and he's changed hearts. To this day, he's still changing hearts. He's still changing lives. He's still changing why do we believe that it's not possible for your family? It is possible. But you have to start to believe it. You have to start to speak it. Knowing that his word will never return back void. You have to understand those things. You have to know that his word is powerful. His word created the heaven and the earth. Everything that we see was created by his breath, by his spoken word. But then again, we can't believe that he can save the rest of our family. I have lost family too that need Jesus as much as any other lost person does. But I'm believing that God was going to do something amazing in their lives and he's going to draw them and bring them to their knees. Because, you know, I have this, this, it's over there in Mexico, when you have a cousin, they're, when you have a, a first cousin, they're called primo hermanos, okay, which means like kind of like a brother when you have your first cousin. And then their kids will call you uncle, Theo. So I have all these nieces just call me uncle and stuff. But years ago, a couple of years ago, one of them reached out to me and to pray for a specific uh, thing, you know, because they follow us on Facebook and YouTube and, and stuff like that. And, but this girl, my niece, she's been on fire for God. She, she gave her life to the Lord. And I looked up a church out there in Chihuahua where she can get planted. And, you know, I hold her accountable. I tell her, well, how's church service today? How was things going? And, but, and I told her, I said, you keep it going, knowing that that seed is what's going to help the rest come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So never stop praying for your loved ones. Never stop praying for your needs. But don't make it about your needs. But make it about the Lord that can supply your needs. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. God is so good and faithful. And he is our ever help in times of need. In, in um, John 15, 16, let's go to 14 and 13 first. And the word of the Lord says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. See, that's a come. We have to be specific when we pray. 
the power to the prayer is how we end our prayer. See right here it says, if you pray in my name, we have to let people understand and know that it's in the name of Jesus. See, because when you pray in his name, in whose name? You and I know that, but the unbeliever that's praying with us don't know that. See, what separates us from every other belief is we, we pray and we seek the power of Christ Jesus. So never be embarrassed to end your prayer in the name of Jesus. Because if it's not going to be ended that way, then there's not much your prayer is going to do because the power comes in His name, in Jesus' name. Not in the words that you spoke, but in the name of Jesus Christ. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then in John 15, 16, it says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. It reminds us that it is okay to request prayer for oneself but don't make it about yourself. There is no indication here that Paul prayed for himself, but he did ask others to do just that. When we have a need, we should call on the saints who know the Lord to pray for us and for our needs. There is a caution we should keep in mind here, though. Our primary focus should be on others a healthy believer is more concerned with the needs of others than he is with his own needs. When we put somebody else's needs before our very own, God takes care of our, our needs. How many of you can agree with that? He really, really takes care of what you and I need or a need for. The root of all psychological and spiritual sickness is a preoccupation with self. When our focus is on our needs more than the needs of others, it reveals a serious flaw in our character. That same preoccupation with self usually makes our own problems worse because it alienates the very people who could offer us the fellowship we need. who could help us carry out the burdens to the Lord in prayer. That's why we come in fellowship here all together, so that we can carry each other's burdens, so that we can pray for one another, so that we can encourage one another. No matter what is it going our way, what challenges are we facing, we know that God is for us and not against us. Amen? We should pray for the needs of others and trust the Lord to care for our own needs. He has already committed himself to care for us. We are to leave our concerns in his care and trust him to see what we have need. He can be trusted. How many of you know that we can trust him? We can trust our Heavenly Father. No matter what, what is it that we're asking Him for, we can trust Him knowing that it's going to come to pass. So church, never stop praying. Never stop believing in the Word of God. Never, never be ashamed to come boldly to the throne of grace and say, Lord, I'm just repeating Your Word back to You, Lord. Your promises that You gave me that Your Word will not return back void but it will accomplish everything that it set out to accomplish. If I'm speaking salvation for my husband, I believe that's going to take place. If I'm speaking salvation for my wife, I know that's going to take place. If I'm speaking for the rest of my family about salvation, I know it's going to take place. It's just a matter of time that they're going to come to the crossroads and they're going to realize that they can no longer move on their own but need our Heavenly Father to move them 
for them. I'm going to close with this. The context of prayer. Paul says that all, all of our praying should be done in the Spirit. Just as a Christian is to be lived in the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, Galatians 5.16. All prayers to be prayed in the Spirit. When we speak of living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, we are referring to a life to live that is controlled by the Spirit. When the Spirit controls of lives, He reveals His control of our lives by producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. You can go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. When we offer prayer and make supplication in the Spirit, He will make His control of our prayer lives evident as well. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? It means that we pray in the name of Jesus. That is how the Lord commanded us to pray. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14. That does not mean that we can attach a magical wand to Jesus' name. At the end of our prayers, and that God has to answer every request prayed that way. When we pray in Jesus' name, means that we ask for the things he would ask for. See, as long as it lines up with his word. And the Bible says that he wishes that none shall perish, but all come to everlasting life. So that's not praying a selfish prayer. That's praying according to his will, according to his word. It means that we pray according to the will of God and the nature of God. We read that the Lord said about himself in the word of God, and we pray about the things he says and he wants. In other words, we allow his word to shape our prayers. Haven't you guys ever heard that saying, um, prayer changes things or something like that? I'm going to add to it a little bit. Prayer changes you. That allows the things around you to change. Why do you think I say that? It's because now you start to think the things that used to be that important to you are not very important. See, but prayer changes us, changes the concept of who we are and who we are in Christ, which allows our circumstance and the things around us to change because now we start looking at them through the eyes of the Lord instead of our own eyes. So remember that prayer doesn't only change things, it changes you that allows things to change around you. And I'm going to close with this. Did I say that a little bit ago? I'm trying to make up a little bit. You know, I'm excited because um, my wife and I are finally going to go on vacation. And we can't wait. I just hope she feels better. She will feel better. See what it means that we pray in cooperation with the Spirit of God within our hearts. Romans 8, 26 and 27, and I'm going to close with this one. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, for as we ought to, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, with groanings which cannot be uttered, and he that searches 
the heart, not what is the mind of the spirit. Because, uh, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit of God guides our praying by promoting us to pray about those things that bring glory to the Father. Remember that everything we do should turn to the Lord. Everything that we say should be to honor the Lord. Everything. You're like, well, it's very easy for you to say, Pastor, but you don't understand what I go through on a daily basis. Well, you know what? I was once there, and I made it a point in my life saying that those situations and those struggles are not going to dictate who I am anymore. I'm not going to change my speech because of it, and I'm not going to get upset because of it, but I'm going to just continue to know that God is working everything out because His Word has declared it. I'm just going to believe and have faith. We can't allow our circumstance or our or a situation that we're facing on a daily basis to change who we are. But so many of us allow those things to change us. It needs to encourage you, church. We need to be encouraged, saying, thank you, Lord. Not thank you for the situation, but thank you for allowing me and believing much in me that I can accomplish this task, difficult task that you have put before me by increasing my faith, by knowing that you're at work, knowing that you're the only one that can pull me out. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not, Jeremiah 33, 3. And it shall come to pass that before they shall call I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Isaiah 65, 24. Matthew 21, 22. All things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Prayer is a valuable resource that we take very lightly, church. Prayer is not plastering it on Facebook. Prayer is seeking the face of God before him and saying, Lord, here I am, Lord. Change me, Lord. It has to start with us, church. In order for the situations around us, we have to change our attitudes. We have to change who we are. We have to change the way we respond. How many of us sometimes don't respond very godly? Well, that has to change between each and every one of us. It has to change because God has called us to be the light of the world. And if we allow every circumstance and every situation in our life change who we are, what's that going to talk about the God that we serve? The world is watching us, church. The world is watching us. So my prayer for you is that every circumstance and everything that comes your way, that God will give you the ability to bring honor and glory to Him through that circumstance and through that situation. I wish I could tell you, give your life to Jesus and you're going to live happily ever after, but that's not the case because we are up against an enemy that wants your soul and he wants it bad. And he's going to do whatever he can to devour you and to take you back into his kingdom. You got to remember, when we weren't serving the Lord, we belonged to him and he wants us back. So he's going to throw whatever he can. He's going to divide us. He's going to make us confused. He's going to do whatever he can. But he knows exactly what buttons to push to make you react exactly like he wants you to react. Don't allow that anymore. Say enough is enough. I'm tired of being your puppet because that's who we are at times. We're his puppets. He tells us to jump and we jump. God has called us to be the light of the world. We are here to be a light in a dark place. And, and allow the Lord work out every situation in your life. You know, our relationships, sometimes they go through battles and they go through things. Think about it. Why? 
You know, a few days before when we were in, since we left home, the enemy was poking us, poking us, me and my wife, like, and that hadn't happened in a long time. He was like, pickle, 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 pickle. And, and, and he kept pickle, 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 pickle. But then we were responding the way he wanted us to respond. Which later on, both me and my wife had to come in repentance, knowing that the enemy was trying to distract us from God's vision, God's purpose in our life. You know, we literally entered the enemy's camp. And we went there for a purpose. But I think we were more blessed than they were. And believe me when I say that, I brought them a word that they're usually not used to hearing. Kind of like a regular Sunday to each and every one of you. <laughs> but God is in the move. God wants us to win souls for his kingdom, for his purpose. Not to grow our buildings, but to grow the kingdom of God here on earth. When Jesus had got lost, and they finally found him, like, where have you been? Don't you know that I'm about my father's business? So next time Scott gets lost and he tells you that, just give him some grace, okay, sister? I don't know why I always have to use him. I have to start picking on somebody else. Probably because he's looking at me directly, so I like to call him out. You know, as, as I had prepared this series for each and every one of you, it wasn't only for you, but it was to teach me. It was to show me how to fight that battle and how to overcome that battle. You know, because we're, and you know, and I've been, you know, it's just, sometimes people can be harsh, you know, your own peers that don't think you should be doing this and stuff, they worry about what you're doing and not concerned about what they're doing. It's not about that. But this has really opened up my eyes and gave me a better understanding of the spiritual warfare that we have and what's going on before our very own eyes now with our government everything's changing see there's power in the name of Jesus that's why they're taking them out of the schools that's why they're taking them out of the country because everybody wants to run this place they don't want Jesus in there because they don't want to feel that conviction. They don't want to, nothing. Amen. But it's up to the church to bring him back where he needs. Amen. See, we need to be, start being the influencer Amen. instead of being the influencee. Right now, the world is influencing us instead of us influencing the world. Amen. That has to stop, church. Amen. And it's going to start with you and I. Amen. The better we handle our situations, the better we handle our our life, the more we walk in the Spirit of God, the more this world is going to recognize that, hey, you know what? There's just something different about them. Because no matter what comes their way, they're not movable. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So how many of you were blessed with this series? Amen. Praise God. God is so awesome and God is so good. Today's our final our final, our final bit, you know, um, next Sunday, you do not want to miss, my wife is going to bring an awesome, awesome message, as she always does, that you don't want to miss. If you don't come on Wednesdays, I encourage you to come, come, start setting that time aside and say, Lord, no matter what, I'm going to attend. Why? Because I believe that word is for me. That's why I'm here. It's easy to miss one, two days, three days, five days, a year. Come and show your support to the Lord. Say to the people, 
Maybe you're doing good, but you know what? Maybe the neighbor be in the side of you ain't doing that good. I need you to lift them up in prayer as we learn. Ed and Darlene opened up their home and started to have Bible studies. Do they do, are they doing it just because they have some free time? No, they're doing it because they want to grow the church. They want to grow you. They want to give you the knowledge that you need to go out and reach those that are lost. They didn't just come and say, hey, you know what, we're, we're always bored. Let's just, no, they're very busy people. And they're doing this for you. So take advantage of that. And it's always good food. <clears throat> but take advantage of those things. Uh, when we get back, um, hopefully by Wednesday I'll have a date but I'm gonna, I have this class that I wanna share with each and every one of you. It's usually a seven week class, but I'm gonna try to condense it all and do it in one day, like on one Saturday, but it would be the whole day, okay? I'll let you guys know the date so that you guys can ask for work off or whatever, but it's, a, it's something that you do not want to miss. It's gonna show you how to defend your faith it's going to show you how to witness, how to minister, and it's going to show you how to answer questions as well. And it's going to show you that who's in control, the Spirit of God. Sometimes when we're ministering to people, we're listening more to them than they're listening to us. And now I'm going to teach you and help you how the Spirit of God can take over that conversation so that they can get an understanding of what's being said and what's being spoken. It might be on a Friday night and Saturday. I don't know, I'm just trying to, I'm taking out parts that ain't really needed, I'm condensing it, because I know everybody's busy and stuff like this, but, but I want to put it together, it's called soul winning, and we'll do it on a Saturday, and then we'll go out there and start witnessing to these people, and put everything to play, to practice, amen? Yeah. Amen, let's go ahead and stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, right now we just come before your holy throne, Father. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. Heavenly Father, we, we're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for your truth, Father God. Father, I know that without a shadow of a doubt, Father God, that you have called us for a time such as this. To endure hardships. To endure the things that we might be going through on a daily basis. And you know what? We understand not every day is like that. There's days that we go through the day just, but we still have to be walking on alert. We still have to be alert. We still have to have our armor down because the enemy will strike when we least expect it. Lord, I know that it's all about you and it should remain about you, Lord. We know that you can do great and mighty things through each and every one of us, Heavenly Father knowing that your word will never return back void, knowing that there is power in your name, Heavenly Father. There is power in the name of Jesus for healing, for restoring, for redeeming. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for never giving up on us. Thank you, Lord, for always looking after us and keeping us from harm, keeping us safe, Lord. Thank you for always answering us. Lord, I thank you, Heavenly Father. I thank you for the church. I thank you for each and every one here today. I thank you for those that are watching online. God, I just pray your protection and your blessing upon their lives right now that they would see your provision in their lives, Heavenly Father. No matter how many lies the enemy has, has gave them, that your truth will set them free from that lie. Knowing that there's value in their lives, knowing that they are worthy. They are very worthy, Lord. That's why you died on the cross for each and every one of us, Father God. Because you've seen us, 
not only as sinners, but you've seen that value that each and every one of us held. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your healing within this church. Give us the boldness, give us the courage, Heavenly Father, to invite our loved ones, to invite our friends, our co-workers, Father God, to hear the message of truth. Father God, because there's an urgency right now. Because you, we know that your arrival will be here soon. A lot sooner than when we anticipate. Heavenly Father, I just pray continued healing over my wife, knowing that it's going to come to pass. Father God, whatever's going on in her body right now, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just touch her, Father God, supernaturally, Father God, so that she can give you all the praise and all the glory, Father God. You're the one that knitted her in her mother's womb. You know everything about her. So, Father God, I, right now I just pray that you touch her, Father God. Touch her, Heavenly Father, right now. Bring healing to her life. Bring healing to her body. Father, I thank you for Sister Annette. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the healing that took place in her. Father God, thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. Thank you for answering her, Father God, so that now she can bring glory to you, Father. Father God, I just continue to pray for Maria's mom, Father God. I just pray that you would just continue to touch her, that your Holy Spirit will continue to have your way with her. We know that she is such a beautiful gift from you, Lord God, and she's a, not only a gift to Maria, but a gift to all of us, Heavenly Father. As we see her come in this morning, Father God, thank you. We just want to say thank you, Father God. Father God, I pray for every marriage that is struggling, for every person, Father God, that is struggling right now within their marriage, Father God, that are present and those that are watching and those that ain't even watching, Father God, I just pray that you would make yourself known in their relationship, Heavenly Father. Father God, that you would bring humility to both people, Father God, husband and wife, Father God, so that they can hear you. And that you would direct them and guide them, Father God, because we know that the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy, but he's not gonna, it's not going to happen here in the church anymore, Father God. He's not going to have his way with us anymore, Father God, because we belong to you. We belong to the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit is, is the one that's in charge now, the one that's going to teach us, the one that's going to guide us, the one that's going to protect us. We just heard it was a blessing to you. You know, the Word of God comes in and transforms our lives from the inside out. What an amazing opportunity. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Right now, if you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now, and I would be honored uh, to pray with you right now. If you've never given your life to Jesus, just repeat this prayer with me. And um, believe in with all of your heart. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that we will be saved. And the Bible also says that Everyone that calls out to the name of the Lord shall be saved. So right now, if you just repeat this prayer with me, say, Heavenly Father, I choose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that you raised him from the dead to give me a new life. So now, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn away from, from my wicked way of living. I turn my heart to you. From this day forward, I want to serve you and I want to do everything that I can to be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just pray that prayer right now, I just want to welcome you into the kingdom of God, into his household. If you have a church I, or you don't have a home church, get plugged into your home church, wherever you may be. If you're in the Albuquerque, New Mexico area, we would love to have you uh, join us for worship here at Majesty Worship Center. Our address is as follows, 3250 Coors Boulevard, Northwest, Suite B. Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87121. We would love to meet you. We would love to, to fellowship with you. So I just pray that you would get plugged into the house of God. God bless you, and thank you for watching.